You may be seated at this time. I want to jump right in this morning. I want you to know that God loves you. And so do I. So does Jacob. We love you. We care about you. But we want to point you to the King of Kings and think about the great invitation. I know some of you have probably sent out an invitation this week, perhaps to sit at the table, your table, for Thanksgiving. You need to know who's coming and who's not. So how big the turkey you buy, is it going to be a little turkey or is it going to be a big, big, big turkey? I know when we grew up in Detroit with five other brothers and uh, all our cousins came over, everybody came over our house and it was a feast. And we loved leftover turkey sandwiches with mayonnaise and salt. How many like that turkey, turkey sandwiches? So um, we love to have leftovers. But there was limited seating. Not so in the invitation that God is offering. And Revelation 19, 6 through 9 tells us, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing water, and like loud pearls of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, that's us, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. You see, in Luke chapter 14, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 15. Jesus was at a Pharisee's house, and Jesus had all kinds of people sitting there, and he reminded them that I have invited everybody to this banquet table, but not many were coming. Not many of the religious people were coming. Not many in Israel were coming to the table. He said, all right, my family doesn't want to come, then I want you to go out into the highways and the byways, and I want you to invite anybody, the homeless, the crippled, the lame, invite them to this supper table. There's room for them. There is a seat at the table for them. You know, this month, as Jacob said, we're sharing this series, A Seat at the Table, in South Florida with over 60 churches. The purpose, of course, is to hopefully mobilize believers in South Florida together. To have compassion and to have a heart like our Father. Wasn't it King David that God said, he has a heart after me? You know, I love watching my grandchildren and how they mimic their fathers, especially the sons and daddy. Daddy will put on a particular outfit, say the Miami Dolphins outfit, the Miami Hurricanes outfit, or the South, or, 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 or the Florida State outfit. And, and whatever daddy wears, the little five, six-year-old will wear also. They're mimicking daddy. I love to see that. They're following in daddy's footsteps. God wants us to have his heartbeat for the lost. You saw last week, or heard last week, when Jacob talked about the love the Father has for the sinner. This week, we want to zero in on to see and hear about his compassion for the sinner, juxtaposed against the religious crowd. And then next week, we're going to find out about how he wanted to build relationships with sinners. So Luke chapter 15, our main passage this morning, it depicts three parables about the Father's heart for the lost. And then after they found what they lost, there was a celebration. Have you ever lost something? <laughs> only later to find out it was right in your pocket. How embarrassing. Have you ever looked for your keys only to find it's in your purse or it's in your pocket? I've lost quite a few things. I, I lost a pickleball paddle, and it was never returned. 
I was ticked off. I took it out on my next opponent. Then I got lost the paddle, and it was returned, and I rejoiced. I remember when Jesus left our, his family and stayed in Jerusalem, and his family traveled for three days before they discovered before they discovered that Jesus was not with them. Can you imagine leaving your children for three days and not knowing where they were? You'd have the, the, the government on your shoulders. You neglected your child. They went back to Jerusalem, and they were so happy to find Jesus in the temple. I remember a story in 1946. There was an eight-year-old by the name of Catherine, and she was in Devil's Den State Park, Arkansas. By the way, it was in Devil's Den State Park where my wife proposed to me. That's right, she proposed to me. She said, we either get married in six months or I'm leaving you. And I said yes, and we got married six months later. It is in the same park, in the same park in 1946, that this young girl, eight years old, was with her brothers by the creek, and she wandered off. And in a few minutes, the parents came, and they could not find her. The minutes turned into hours, and the hours turned into days. Five, six, seven days, they could not find her. Could you imagine losing your loved one? Remember, this is spread out over 25 acres of taverns, creeks, caves, forests. They had lost all hope of finding her. Finally, the rescue team, one of them heard a faint voice in a cave and they discovered her seven miles from where they were at the creek. Boy, did that family celebrate the reunion of their daughter with the family. Well, you know that Jesus said that a lost soul is more valuable than just finding your daughter or your son because you will only have them temporarily. Here's what Jesus, here's what the Father thinks about one soul in Mark 8. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their own soul? Do you see the value that God puts on one soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Jesus talked about it over and over in his world, in his word. When when someone found the pearl that was so valuable, they gave up everything to purchase that pearl. Or when hunting for some property and they found some treasure in that land that was very valuable, they went away and sold everything they had in order to purchase this piece of property with this treasure hidden in that land. God is telling us how valuable a soul is to him. And so, Over 60 churches are looking to mobilize hundreds and thousands of believers to embrace the Father's compassion, His heart for lost people. Here's the problem. Only 3% of the population in South Florida has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know how big the population is in Broward County, West Palm Beach, and Dade County. There are over 6 million people in these counties. So the problem is there's not enough people. And in Matthew 9, I recall Jesus saying this to the crowd. The harvest in Broward County is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the one in charge of the harvest and ask him to recruit more workers for his harvest field. God is looking for 
people like you, who he has saved, to share their faith because the harvest is plentiful. The opportunity is great in South Florida. Someone took a survey and said that over 70% of the population in South Florida is willing to hear from you and me a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 70%. But only 3% are believers. So we need to pray for the harvest. Let us bow for prayer. Father, I remember now is always the time to pray. And as a pastor, when I stand before the people of the Lord, we want, I want so badly for the Holy Spirit to speak to me and to speak to them about what you're, what you're communicating to us. Help, us. help them to look past me and see your heart for the lost. And many of us want to have the same heart that you have. We want to have compassion on those you have compassion on. We want to be just like you. And so would you raise up an army of people right here in this church? Would you make this a soul-winning church, Father? Will we bring the lost to you, a seat at the table? And then all these other churches in South Florida that are communicating the same message, I pray that you will raise up a harvest from those churches of labors to go into the harvest field of the lost. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what is your heart like for the lost? In Luke chapter 15, it begins this way. I've entitled this message, An Invitation to the Celebration. An Invitation to the Celebration. And that's what Jesus is constantly doing. And so he had just left a Pharisee's home and he was speaking to a large crowd. And and the scripture tells us in verse one, now the tax collectors, remember they were not well liked, and the sinners, they wanted to hear Jesus, were gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Right there in this passage, we find out who has compassion for the lost. Well, we see our Father has compassion for the lost. We see that Jesus has compassion for the lost. We see sinners have compassion for fellow sinners. And they wanted to bring people to Jesus so they would no longer be lost. But the very people that you would think that would be excited about sinners coming to Jesus, they were not. There was a rabbinical saying, let not a man associate with the wicked, not even to bring him to the law or to the gospel. That was a rabbinical saying that summed up these people's attitude. If you wonder why sometimes a pastor might be a little harsh on other religious leaders, It's because of this. These religious people were the very people communicating the gospel, the good news of God in the Old Testament. Remember what Jesus said about them. Listen to what they're saying, but don't do what they're doing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to find out those communicating the gospel, whether or not they love God and are living for God. These people detested sinners. They didn't even want to be around them. They didn't even want to bring anybody to the good news of salvation. I think if you think I'm exaggerating about this idea of inviting people to the table and then celebrating that experience, then let's look at the parables found in Luke chapter 15. There are three parables, one of sheep, one of a lost coin, and one of a son that was lost. Let's look at the celebration of finding a material possession. The first one is a sheep. Now, as I read this, Think about the Father's compassion 
for the lost. Remember, he gives us parables about reality, but really communicating a spiritual truth to you and me. Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. So Jesus uses this illustration to, 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 to remind these people, these religious people, his compassion for the lost. He said, if you had a hundred sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go and search for the lost ones until you found it? And then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulders. And when you arrived, you would call together your friends and neighbors to rejoice with you because you, your lost sheep was found. Do you hear God speaking to you and me? He cares for the lost. A second illustration he gives us to communicate his compassion for the lost. Luke 15, 8 through 9, the parable of the lost coin. Or take another illustration. A woman has 10 valuable silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and look in every corner of the house and sweep every nook and cranny until she finds it? And then won't she call in her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her? God is setting them up. You understand that you would be excited if you lost one of your animals or lost something very valuable in your home. Now he gets to a human being, a celebration of human restoration. We're way more important than a sheep or a coin. You're going to see the father's heart in this short parable. Remember, the father has two sons. He's probably a well-off farmer. And can you imagine one of your children coming to you and saying, I have six kids, and saying, Daddy, I would like my inheritance now. If Jacob came to me and said, I want my inheritance right now. Well, if he would have asked me that 20 years ago, I would have given it to him. I had very little back then. That's exactly what this young man did. He came to his dad and said, I'd like to have my inheritance now. Would you give it to me? And the dad did. Well, guess what? If you give a, a 25-year-old, 30-year-old a million dollars, what are they going to do with it? Invest it? Build a business? No, he went off and lived a wild life impressing all his friends at the bar, the drinks are on me. Spending money lavishly on gifts and presents and wild living and alcohol and drugs and women, that's what the scripture says. Then he spent all his money. He couldn't even get a job. He thinks to himself, you know, my dad has servants that are living better than I am living. I'm gonna go back to my dad and say, Dad, I'm not worthy to even be your son. I'll be a slave. So let's pick up this story. He goes back to his father, Luke chapter 15, verse 21. Notice his heart. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now watch this. Now this is where every one of us were. And Jesus is trying to communicate this to the religious leaders and to you and me. Look at the Father's heart. Luke 15, 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, he didn't sit there and go, come here, son. Come here. I got something I want to tell you. No. Notice, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Maybe that's why the writer wrote the song, Running to the Father. The Father's running after me, running after me. But he's running after someone who has humbled themselves and repented of their sins and is asking God for mercy. Amen. That's the person that he's going after. Now notice it continues in Luke chapter 15, verse 22. He not only runs to him, but then he celebrates him. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. 
Put a finger, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Why? For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. An invitation to the celebration. Can you see the father's heart? Do you want to have a heart like him? Do you remember when you were in the exact situation that this lost young man was in? Do you recall the excitement and enthusiasm that you had when you believed? Do you remember the day before you received the good news? Do you remember what you were like? You were just like that prodigal son. You were lost, away from all his inheritance, away from the love of the Father. But someone had compassion on you. Do you remember that person? Do you remember that family? Do you remember your mom and dad? Do you remember your brother or sister? Do you remember your coworker, your neighbor who shared the gospel? I remember knocking on doors and going into the homes and trying to sell my product to these families. And these families had compassion on me and said, I want to tell you a story about someone who loves you just like you are and will forgive you of your sins and give you eternal life. They had compassion on a stranger. Remember, the scripture says, be careful when someone knocks on your door. It may be an angel. They quickly found out I was not an angel. But they never knew what would happen. And I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, the good news, and I wanted everyone to celebrate with me. The problem is, a lot of your family, they're not going to celebrate with you. A lot of your coworkers, they're not going to celebrate with you. A lot of your friends, they're not going to celebrate with you. That's where the church comes in the body of Christ. We will celebrate over one individual giving their life to Jesus Christ. And may today be the day that someone here or looking in online says, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. I need the love of the Father. Well, you need to know that when you think we are celebrating, do you know that the scripture teaches us there really truly is a celebration over one individual getting saved? When I think about one individual, my heart is sad because I think about the, the vast ocean of lost humanity and only one person. I feel like a salesman, Lord, when I go out there. No one's, no one's buying your love. And only one Let's look at what the scripture teaches us about one. Luke 10, 15. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now let me give it to you in a paraphrased version. It's not that my go-to. It says, count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. My children call me up, mom and dad, and they celebrate with us every time one of their children, one of our grandkids, come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And many mark it down in their Bibles, and they celebrate that the following year as one of their birthdays. We, in the Bramus family, celebrate the salvation of our children and our grandchildren. Heaven is celebrating over one individual that gives their lives to Christ. You want to know the compassion of the Father? Remember a week before Jesus is about to give his life for you and me. Remember, it costs the father his son. It costs Jesus something. And it costs this prodigal son's father something. The inheritance he already gave his son, and then the party that he threw. 
But notice the compassion of Jesus in this passage in Matthew 23. The week before he's about to die, he goes into the very people that he came to to die for. Here's what he says. Hear the heartbeat of the Father. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Father has compassion on the lost, your lost child, your lost brother or sister, your lost neighbor, your lost coworker. He has compassion on them. Do I have the same kind of passion? I do, I do hurt for my neighbors. I have been begging God to work in my neighborhood that the Holy Spirit would fall upon our neighborhood and bring conviction into their hearts and convince them that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Messiah. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You and me cannot do it. Are you praying for a mighty work to take place in this church and in your life? You, the church, you represent the church. When you leave this place, you go to your home, and that's the mission field. Too often... We make the church the mission field instead of where you live at. You see, you have earned the right to speak to your neighbor. I have not. They know whether you live for Christ. They don't know me when you go to work. They know whether you love Jesus or not. Their ears are open to you, not me, not this church. Your family, they don't know me. They know you. They know whether you live for Jesus Christ or not. Do you have a heart like the Father for your family members? I recall I have five other brothers. And all my brothers, including my mom, have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I remember my oldest brother, who's now 70, still a bodybuilder, still trains lawyers and doctors how to be physically fit. He called me about 10 years ago. He said, Ron, I want you to know something. Someone invited me to an evangelistic meeting in my neighborhood. He had two preachers in the neighborhood. They invited them to a meeting with Ray Comfort. You know who Ray Comfort is? And he heard him. He said, I'm calling you. I want you to be the first to know that I gave my life to Jesus Christ as Savior. And this is around 60 years old. It's never too late. I've been praying for my brothers to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Do you have a a passion for your brothers and your sisters, for your mom or dad, or for your neighborhood? You know, even when I play sports, every time I go out there, and I, I, you know, when you hear this, every time, you're probably wondering, is that true? First of all, I go out there and say, every time I go out there, Lord, would you help me? because I want to be light and salt. Do I mean every time? Yes, I do. Every time I go out there, because I don't want my mouth to betray who I am. We can get kind of competitive out there, right, Yeshua? And I get out there. And you can know who the believers are or not, because as soon as they hit a bad hit out there, guess what they say? No, don't repeat it. Keep it quiet. It's an F word or a G word. Now, what am I doing under my breath? Lord, look at those stinking, rotten sinners here. I'm so much better than them. I don't use your name. You know what? Everybody knows what my name is. Ronnie Arthur. When I hit a ball and miss it, Ronnie Arthur. I heard it the other day. We know what your middle, your last name is. No, it's not. It's not Ronnie Arthur. It's Ronnie Arthur Bremus. But when I miss a ball, I say, Ronnie Arthur. I don't cuss anymore. Now, when they do, immediately I say this. Father, I do. Under my breath, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Please, please use me. There's been, I've told you this before, there's been a crippled guy that comes up in a wheelchair. And I keep begging God, Lord, would you like to do something special there? Let me go lay hands, not me, because let me tell you, I don't know if I can handle 
the glory and the credit because I know I couldn't do it. But could you imagine me laying hands and the guy jumps up and he's free? And, oh, how am I going to deal with that? But I have been praying. I've actually, <laughs> I've actually walked up to him quietly with no one looking around so I wouldn't look like a fool. Lord, are you ready? Do you want to do something, Lord? <laughs> I've done that. I, I literally have done that to that guy in the wheelchair. But could you imagine if that guy jumped up and everyone that's seen this guy pull up in a wheelchair, all of a sudden, they're all getting, what happened? Let me tell you the story of why he's risen on his feet because of Jesus Christ. Oh, I've been looking for that opportunity. He may do that. We must live in expectation. Do you have compassion on those people that you hang around and rub shoulders with? I cannot do it, but we must pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will work through your life and my life that will bring conviction. What's absent in our churches today is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, and it's not him, it's who? Us. Compassion, like like Jesus. We flip the script, and this parable ends in a different way. The parable of the prodigal son Contrast the sinner and the tax collector and Jesus and the Father with the brother and the Pharisees who are not excited at all about this person coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior or coming back home. The brother has literally, this guy who sits in the church sees a smelly sinner come into the church He's not excited about the smell. Jacob brought this up last week. The way that person's dressed, the way they smell. They're looking down their nose. They have a self-righteousness about themselves like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. I pray that there's no one in this church like that. And the brother was like that. Here's what the scripture teaches us about his attitude and his heart for the lost. Luke 15 Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house and heard the music and the dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother was jumping up and down. Listen. If I gave, and we had six boys, and I, or six kids, and I gave Jacob the inheritance, he blows it all. He comes crawling back on his knees home and says, Dad, I'm not worthy to be called your son, but would you please take me back in? And I do. What do you think my five other, other children are going to think? Make sure he's, now make sure the will, Dad, you got the will? Make sure he's out. He already got his parts. You can imagine. Come on, put yourself in their shoes. You can imagine what this brother's thinking. So don't, let's don't throw him out with the wolves yet. But he's forgetting something. He's forgetting that he is a sinner. And that he, even if he's saved now, or if you're saved now, you once were like this young man, lost in sin, destined for hell and judgment. Your name's not written in the book of life. Sometimes people in the church forget that. First, by their attitude toward the lost, and secondly, by the failure to communicate this good news to the lost. That's a self-righteous attitude that this brother had and the Pharisees had. Notice, he had no heart like his father. It picks up again. So his father went out and pleaded with him. That's what the father does. If you don't understand, when he came down to earth and hung there on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, that means you and me, they don't know what they're doing. He has compassion on you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What does that tell you? He doesn't want you to spend eternity in hell. He wants to save you, forgive you, give you a new heart give you a home, and give you a seat at the table at the marriage feast of the Lamb. So as the father goes out and pleads with his son, this church-going person, this Pharisee, this religious person. I mean, 
This is not just a religious person. These are the very people, like Jacob and me, that communicated God to the people. These are the people that he's speaking to. They have no passion or compassion for the loss. So he's, he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Notice his attitude toward the father. Notice some people's attitude toward God. They claim to be saints. They're in the church. But what is your attitude toward the father, towards Jesus? This gives us a snapshot of how some people think or how some people who are saved and serve the Father. Let's continue. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could go celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, notice he he disassociates his brother with him, this son of yours. Notice his attitude toward the lost. He has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. You kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said. Now, remember, he's speaking to the Israelites. He's speaking to the Jewish people. These two brothers were Jewish people. They think they have an automatic right to be at the table, a seat at the table. We're Abraham's kids, but they're really lost, but they're acting religious and they're acting pious, and they're going through all the religious moves, sing the songs. But notice their attitude toward the Father in heaven. This is what God is communicating to you and me through this parable. My son, he said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, He was lost, and he is found. See, we learn from this passage that it's possible to be near the Father and maybe even be doing the Father's work, but not have the Father's heart. In all my years of ministry, I have been around some of these people, and they were in the church. But I don't speak bad about the church because Jesus is the father of the church. He is the groom of the church. He is the founder of the church. And the people that believe in him act like him, talk like him, walk like him, and behave like him. But there are people that get around believers. They sneak in, weasel their way in. They have no relationship with the father, but they confuse the lost person and even the believers at times. Well, if that's how God is, and I don't want anything to do with God and Jesus. But if they're like this young man, then you would say they don't have the heart of the father. See, there are people that have done God's work, but they don't even know him. Just because you do God's work doesn't mean you know him. Case in point, you remember in Matthew 25, when Jesus judges Every one of us. And he said, do you remember? And they said, do you remember when I cast out demons in your name? Jesus said to them, these religious people who did religious activity, depart from me, I never knew you. So it is very possible to sit where you're sitting and not have a father's heart and not know him personally as Lord and Savior. Have you repented of your sins and put your faith in him like this prodigal son did? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I come back as a slave, as a servant. The Father loves to exalt the humble. He will exalt you. What kind of heart do you have for the lost? As we get back to that passage, as we end, wind up with this passage... In Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, remember how he started this. Now, the tax collector and the sinner, that's me, that's who I was, that's who you were, 
We were sinners, liars, cheaters, adulterers, coveters, cursers of God's name. That's what we once were. And he said, they were gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so I want to ask you this morning, do you, do I have a self-righteous indifference or even a cold animosity toward the lost people that I rub shoulders with, that you rub shoulders with? Don't think that God is asking you to go knock on doors to a complete stranger and share the gospel. He may, but can you start with those people that you love or that you rub shoulders with or that you work with? Can you begin to say, Father, you know, I am sorry. You see, when you're... I made a mistake in this church. You see, I had the attitude that if you love God, if you loved him, it would spill over into your life and that you would want to communicate the love of the Father with others. What I failed to do was disciple the people that had a love for Jesus Christ. I did my family members. I'm going to do, we're going to do a better job next year 2024, God willing, he doesn't come back in the clouds for us. I want to do it better at discipling individuals who want to win their brothers and their sisters, their moms and dads, their co-workers to Jesus Christ. But I've always felt, why should I beg someone to give? Why should I beg someone to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Because someone has said it's, it's like A sinner gets saved. It's like one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. I wanted everyone to know who Jesus was. It wasn't until I got around church people that they started making me feel uncomfortable. When I got saved, let me tell you something. I was wrong. I went to my first job in a week. I started preaching the gospel to everybody. I thought that was my job. I had a ninth grade education at that time. I remember putting someone up against the wall. You need Jesus in your heart right now. I probably scared the living daylights out of him. I didn't last too long in that job. I thought that was my job to win the loss. It, no one told me. No one educated me. It was just natural. I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love. You ever heard that song? I was in love. I could care less what anybody thought about me. I remember going to my first church, and within one week, I remember standing there, and the pastor, who was a legalist, say to me, you need to get your hair cut. You're going to get your hair cut, aren't you, son? Man, I said, I'll do anything to get out of hell. You see my attitude, what it was? Unlike many people that come to Christ, it's, it's like pulling eye teeth. I, I didn't care. I was willing to give up everything. In fact, I did. Everything's yours. I didn't have much, but I gave him everything. That's the natural overflow, the love of the Father for you and for me, and it just started coming out. And it's sometimes when we get in the church, we think this is normal, and we start going out there acting that way and behaving that way and communicating that way instead of telling others about Jesus. I'm afraid that we're too worried about what people think about us, aren't we? That's why when I go out to the pickleball court, you got to pray for me because everyone now knows by now who I am. They know who I am, the preacher. They'll tell me. I, I didn't want to be known as a preacher. I want to be known as a good pickleball player and a believer in Jesus Christ. That, honestly, that's what I want to be known for. I don't want to be because I know now the pressure's on, but I, I laugh at pressure. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> But I mean, I, I, got, I want to communicate the good news, and I am sharing the good news. I got a couple of Jewish lawyers. I'm talking to them. I'm playing pickleball with them. I've gotten two to read Isaiah chapter 53. I'm all excited, but I, I, I want to see a harvest. I want to see something happen out there. I want to see something happen in my neighborhood. I'm praying, what do you want me to do this Christmas, Lord? Is there anything that you'd like me to do this Christmas? For the people around me, I'm thinking of writing a little letter to them and saying, listen, I have not knocked on your door and said... You know, you're going to hell if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. That'll keep your neighbors away from you if you don't want anybody bothering you. (laughs) 
But we have sent out little baskets in our neighborhood on Easter and Christmas. This time I'm thinking of saying, and by the way, the reason I haven't done that, two reasons. One, my, my wife said, honey, we're here to build relationships. Jacob will be talking about that next week. And that's true. But how long are you going to build that relationship? It's been five years now. It's been 10 years. It's been 15 years. So that's her view. And then secondly, I did feel uncomfortable asking people to come to church because I felt like I was asking them to come to here to build a business. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So I didn't want to do that. So now I'm thinking of writing a letter to him during this Christmas and saying, listen, my son's taken over. Now he's now the lead pastor. And uh, I want to apologize for not sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with you. And if you are willing to have conversation about God and Jesus, text me, call me, and we'll meet in my home. Now, I'm talking pretty brave right now. <laughs> Pray that I'll have the courage to write that to my neighbors. They, they already know who I am. Well, I got nothing to lose, right? They're not knocking on my door asking me to come over to their house for dinner or anything like that. They don't invite me to any of their parties, you know. So I got nothing to lose. But I'm thinking that way. So really, the moral of the story today is, guys, be intentional. Be intentional about sharing the good news of what the Father did for you that he wants to do for them. And there's nothing greater, I think, that when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have as many as Billy the Graham. I can't compare myself to him. You can't compare yourself to Jacob or me. I can't compare myself to you or all the other evangelists that we have in our church that go out into the byways all the time, into the neighborhoods and share Christ. I'm not you. You're not me. But I do know all my children are going to be walking behind me. And I know that they're not going to jump into the pits of hell because mom and daddy told them about Jesus. And then they married someone that loved Jesus. And then they're telling our grandkids about Jesus. And there's going to be other people that I don't even know about. Just like there are people that shared Christ with me that I'm going to be excited about seeing. But Jesus, I, I, I did a few things right. Remember the Bible says, you've been faithful in a few things. I will make you rule over many things. How many remember that passage there? So it's no braggadocious stuff that, Lord, look what I did. No, it's, God, I wanted them to know about you. And, and there they are. And there may be more or less than I ever thought. What a, what a beautiful blessing. I, I would feel uncomfortable, wouldn't you? stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords knowing I never shared Jesus with one person I would be embarrassed Jesus you weren't that important in my life yeah I went to church I sang I gave but I never shared because I was so afraid of what they think about me Jesus did say if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Something to ponder on. Would you stand at this time? I pray today that God will raise up more men and women, young men and women, that say, God, I will share my faith. I will have a heart like you. And perhaps there is someone here. There's going to be no begging or pleading. Perhaps the Holy Spirit was working on someone here or even online. We'd love to know you heard the message. You're willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Be bold. Come forward and say, I want to get baptized and identify myself with Jesus now because I'm coming out of the closet. Let us know in the tag section. Someone will get back with you. If you'd like to make the decision, we ask our prayer warriors to come up front at this time to pray for you about that or some other decision about some people that you are praying for in your neighborhood, your work, or that you will become a bold witness for Christ. We're here to pray for you. We're not going to beg or plead, but if God's speaking to you, please, if he's knocking on your heart like he once did, would you respond and be obedient to the Holy Spirit? Would you call? Come.